Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. I wiped the sweat from my brow as I carefully brushed away centuries of sand from the stone door. My team had been excavating this remote Peruvian desert site for weeks, following whispered legends of an ancient tunnel. As the last grains fell away, strange markings were revealed, unlike any I had seen in my years of archaeological work. With a grinding screech, the door slowly opened, revealing a dark passage beyond. My heart raced as I stepped inside, my headlamp illuminating two sarcophagi. What I found inside would challenge everything I thought I knew about human history. In one sarcophagus lay a small, mummified body, but it was the contents of the second that truly shocked me. A disembodied hand, perfectly preserved, with impossibly long fingers. My scientific mind reeled as I examined it. Three fingers, each as long as my forearm, ended in what looked like human fingernails. Weeks later, I sat in a dimly lit lab, staring at x-rays in disbelief. The hand's internal structure defied explanation. Six bones in each finger, double what should be there. My colleague shook his head in wonder. It's real, he said. Bone and flesh, but it's not human. Not any animal we know. As word of the discovery spread, theories multiplied. Some whispered of extraterrestrials, others of lost civilizations. I found myself caught in a whirlwind of secret meetings and hushed conversations with government officials. One night, as I worked late in the lab, a stranger appeared. He spoke of hidden Incan secrets. He offered to help unravel the mystery, but warned of powerful forces that wanted the truth buried. I looked at the ancient hand, its elongated fingers, seeming to point towards some unimaginable truth. Whatever its origin, I knew my discovery would rewrite history. That is, if I'm right in what I believe I have found. In 2017, a bizarre discovery was made in the Peruvian desert. A mummified, three-fingered hand with eight-inch fingers, along with a tiny mummified body and an elongated skull. After a swarm of amateur archaeologists and ufologists claimed an extraterrestrial body had been found, it was later deemed by experts to be nothing but an elaborate hoax. But when examined by a physician in Cusco, the hand was found to be made of real bone and skin. This prompted further investigation, and now one of the mummies is giving us some puzzling results after being more carefully examined. Results that seem humanoid, but not human. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… In the early morning hours of August 5, 1962, Marilyn Monroe was found dead inside her Los Angeles home of an apparent drug overdose, but suspicions of foul play have persisted ever since. Within the span of about 80 years, two terrifying beasts emerged to haunt the lives of two European communities. From the werewolf of Ansbach to the mysterious beast of Gévaudan, these creatures blurred the line between reality and legend 
leaving a trail of dead bodies and people who even hundreds of years later in these areas are still frightened to go out after dark. The Hellfire Club, a secret society from the 1700s, provided a space for high-standing individuals to indulge in intellectual pursuits and social activities without judgment. But it also became infamous for its rumored hedonistic behaviors and dark rituals, though its true purpose and activities remain shrouded in mystery even today, making the rumors about it all the more tantalizing. In 2003, Christine Paolila shocked her Texas community by going from a bullied high school student to a convicted killer. It's a tragic story of friendship, love, drugs, violence, and murder. Oakville, Washington, a small town with fewer than a thousand residents, experienced an unusual event in the summer of 1994. On August 7th, clear gelatinous blobs fell from the sky soon followed by a mysterious illness affecting the townspeople. Despite various theories, from jellyfish particles to star jelly, the true nature of the Oakville blobs remains a mystery, leaving the town and the rest of the world without clear answers. But first, could it possibly be true that the three-fingered mummies found in Peru, eventually deemed to be a hoax, are in fact real extraterrestrial bodies? new evidence seems to indicate so. We begin there. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. In 2017, a mummified three-fingered hand with eight-inch fingers was found in a Peruvian tunnel in the desert. At first glance, it looked like a creative, man-made fake, but a physician in Cusco, Peru examined it and found it to be made of skin and bone, with six bones in each finger. The strange hand was given to Brian Forster, who runs Hidden Inca Tours, along with a small, mummified, elongated skull and a tiny, mummified body. The person who had these items told Forrester they were found in a tunnel in January 2016 in the southern desert of Peru. This tunnel was closed off by a large stone door, and inside they found two sarcophagi with the body parts covered in clay. The owner didn't want to sell them, he just wanted to know what they were and who or what they belonged to. Brian Forster took the hand and skull to physicians in Cusco who wanted to stay anonymous. They x-rayed the hand and found it had six bones in each finger, while a regular human hand has only three bones, or phalanges, per finger. The examination showed that the hand was made of real bone and skin, suggesting it wasn't a fake, unless someone made it using real bones, flesh, and skin, which would have been a daunting task for the sake of a hoax. An animal with three fingers or toes is known as a tridactyl, and most tridactyls are reptiles or birds, with some exceptions like the rhinoceros. The mummified hand found in Peru didn't fit into any of these categories because the fingers had nails like humans or primates. All primates have five fingers and toes except for the small spider monkey which has four. Therefore, the hand was a mystery, appearing neither human nor animal no known animal, at least. The physicians told Forrester that it wasn't human but belonged to a life form of some kind. The mummified hand was allegedly found in a sarcophagus, along with an infant-sized elongated skull and a tiny mummified body which also didn't look human. People who examined the objects concluded that they might be extraterrestrial, belonging to several different species, or that they were from an ancient human-like species. The only other logical idea is that it was an elaborate hoax, and someone would have had to put a lot of time and effort into making these body parts using organic material. Mutations were also a possibility which could explain one of the subjects, but it would be highly unlikely that all three artifacts are mutations of known species. Despite the enormous amount of work it would take to create such an elaborate and convincing hoax, 
there are those who have firmly fallen on that side of the argument. A documentary from Gaia.com claimed that what looked like a mummified corpse was evidence of a new species, possibly from outer space. But this claim raised eyebrows because Gaia.com had a history of making videos about ancient aliens, none of which turned out to be true. So what about the mummy itself? The mummy was said to be found in the Nazca region of Peru. This made some sense, because similar human mummies had been found there before. The dry climate of the region helped preserve bodies by naturally drying them out. The three-fingered mummy was in a fetal pose, which was common for real mummies that were wrapped in cloth bundles. Peru continues to be a place where ancient human mummies are found, but skeptics claimed there were reasons to suspect this might be a modern fake, especially because of the people involved. According to the skeptics, Jamie Masson was a UFO enthusiast and journalist known for making wild claims about aliens without solid evidence. He seemed to be the one who led Gaia to the mummy. Jay Widener from Gaia had a long history of making strange videos about things like chemtrails and the sun. He wasn't a neutral filmmaker and believed in unscientific ideas, like aliens called archons controlling humans. Dr. Konstantin Korotkov was an expert in pseudoscience, using a type of Curlian photography to investigate the soul leaving the body. Dr. Jose de Jesus Zolche Benitez had worked with Masson before on something called the Roswell Slides. He analyzed a photo he said showed a non-human body at Roswell, but it turned out to be a mummified child from a museum in South America. His track record wasn't great. M.K. Jesse seemed to be a real radiologist but didn't give much information, only saying that the small images she saw made it unlikely to be a modified human skeleton. Natalia Zalazanaja, who was said to be the head of image analysis, might have been a real doctor but didn't say anything important. Given the backgrounds of these people, many found it hard to believe the claims that the mummies were genuinely extraterrestrial especially without more independent evidence. So, fake seemed like the most likely explanation for the mummy. But now more independent evidence has surfaced. While many scientists thought these mummies were just a hoax or that tomb robbers had messed with the bodies to make them look alien, recent studies have shown something different. One of these mummies, which they have named Maria, was analyzed by scientists and they found out some fascinating things about her. Maria's skull is very different from a human's skull. It is elongated and does not show any signs of being shaped that way on purpose. This means her skull might have naturally been that shape. Scientists also found out that Maria lived a long time ago between 240 and 383 AD. Maria and five other mummies were found in a tomb in Nazca, a city in southern Peru. Jamie Masson, a journalist and UFO expert, was the one who found these mummies. He believed they were extraterrestrials who once lived on Earth. Most scientists, however, thought they were just regular mummies that had been tampered with. In 2018, scientists did DNA tests and other studies on the mummies, including Maria. They concluded that the mummies were indeed human. For most, that was the end of the story. But Masson and other researchers kept studying the mummies, hoping to find more clues. A new study conducted by scientists in Peru discovered some very unusual features about Maria. Maria did not have hair or outer ears, just ear canals. Her skull was also very different from ours. It was 30% larger than a typical human skull. Scans showed that Maria had bulging eyes and a protruding jaw, she was also missing six teeth, and the remaining teeth were very worn down. She didn't have any wisdom teeth either. Maria's arms and legs were the most unusual. Her hands were as wide as a human's, but about 20 centimeters longer. Each finger had four bones, or phalanges in scientific terms, instead of three bones like humans. Her feet were also unique. They had three toes, each with four phalanges, and were about 23 centimeters longer than human feet. Her heel bone was different too, which made scientists think she didn't walk completely upright but possibly moved in a hunched over way in order to keep her balance. Maria also suffered from arthritis in her arms and legs and had spinal damage. Another odd finding, 
Scientists determined Maria was female but had some features that were typically male at the same time. In the end, scientists concluded that Maria was a desiccated humanoid body with a biological architecture similar to that of a human but exhibiting numerous structural differences as well as morphological and anatomical features. This means Maria's body was dried out but still had some identifiable parts that humans have, yet with many unusual differences. Is Maria the product of a human hoax? The product of an extraterrestrial and human hybrid program? Perhaps fully alien? All I can say is, the truth is out there. Coming up, in the early morning hours of August 5, 1962, Marilyn Monroe was found dead inside her Los Angeles home of an apparent drug overdose. But suspicions of foul play have persisted ever since. And then, within the span of about 80 years, two terrifying beasts emerged to haunt the lives of two European communities. From the werewolf of Ansbach to the mysterious beast of Gévaudan, these creatures blurred the line between reality and legend, leaving a trail of dead bodies and people who, even hundreds of years later in these areas, are still frightened to go out after dark. These stories and more when Weird Darkness Returns. In the near future, virtual reality games are indistinguishable from the real world. Players can take on the role of a star quarterback or rule as the king of a virtual kingdom. 13-year-old Jake prefers to spend his free time building Zaloria, a virtual world he created from scratch, where he and his two best friends, Des and Carrie, spend their afternoons completing quests and collecting treasure. However, all in Zaloria is not what Jake expected. When Jake discovers that the world he built is growing and changing on its own, he and his friends uncover a secret that could change the world forever. Jake and his friends must fight for survival when his virtual world takes on a mind of its own. Game Alive, a science fiction adventure novel by Trip Ellington, narrated by Darren Marlar. Here a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Marilyn Monroe was more than just a movie star. She was an icon of Hollywood's golden age. Her beauty, talent, and charm captivated audiences around the world. But on August 4, 1962, tragedy struck. Marilyn Monroe, only 36 years old, was found dead in her Los Angeles home. This shocking event not only ended the life of a beloved actress, but also sparked decades of questions theories, and conspiracies. According to the official reports, Monroe's housekeeper, Eunice Murray, became worried in the early hours of August 5th when she noticed the light still on in Monroe's bedroom. After knocking and getting no response, Murray called Monroe's psychiatrist, Dr. Ralph Greenson, and when he arrived, he broke into the room through a window and found Monroe unresponsive in her bed. Monroe's personal physician, Dr. Hyman Engelberg, was called to the scene and pronounced her dead at around 4.30 a.m. The police were then notified. When they arrived, they found an array of prescription pill bottles on Monroe's nightstand. The Los Angeles County Coroner's Office performed an autopsy later that day. The toxicology report showed high levels of chloral hydrate, a sleeping medication, and barbiturates in her blood. Based on these findings, the coroner ruled Monroe's death a probable suicide. While the official verdict was suicide, many people close to Monroe found this hard to believe. Her friends and colleagues pointed out several factors that didn't align with the idea of Monroe taking her own life. First, there was her positive mood. Several friends reported that Monroe seemed happy and optimistic in the days leading up to her death. Actor James Bacon said he saw her just days before and she was in tremendous spirits, even talking about future plans. 
Plus, she was very much looking forward to some career opportunities. Monroe had recently been rehired for the movie Something's Gotta Give, from which she had previously been fired. This career revival seemed at odds with someone contemplating suicide. There is also the lack of a suicide note. Monroe left no final message or explanation, which some found unusual for someone planning to end their life. And finally, the physical evidence doesn't fit the official story. The autopsy report stated that Monroe's death was caused by ingesting a large number of pills. However, no pill residue was found in her stomach, raising questions about how the drugs entered her system. As more details about the night of Monroe's death emerged, several odd circumstances fueled further speculation. When police arrived at Monroe's home, they found her housekeeper, Eunice Murray, washing the actress's bedsheets. This behavior struck many as suspicious, as it could have destroyed potential evidence. Within 48 hours of Monroe's death, her business manager, Inez Melson, removed several bags of documents from the actress's home. This occurred while police still were investigating the scene. There were inconsistencies in the reported timeline of events on the night of Monroe's death, with some witnesses changing their stories over time. The autopsy revealed a small, unexplained bruise on Monroe's lower body. Some theorists suggest this could have been the site of a fatal injection. Because of all the inconsistencies, over the years numerous conspiracy theories have emerged about Monroe's death. While many of these lack solid evidence, they persist in popular culture, and the more time that goes by, the stronger the implications and beliefs about them become. One of the most famous theories involves Monroe's alleged relationships with President John F. Kennedy and his brother Robert Kennedy. Some believe Monroe was murdered to prevent her from revealing sensitive information about these powerful men. Another theory suggests that organized crime figures orchestrated Monroe's death. According to this idea, the mob planned to use evidence of Monroe's affair with the Kennedys for blackmail, and she was killed to prevent her from exposing this plot. Some theorists believe Monroe was killed by people who wanted control of her estate. Her will, which left significant portions of her wealth to her psychiatrists, has been a source of suspicion for some. There are also allegations that evidence was destroyed or that the investigation was deliberately mishandled to conceal the true circumstances of Monroe's death. The persistent questions and theories surrounding Monroe's death led to a new investigation in 1982, 20 years after her passing. This review, conducted by the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office, aimed to address the lingering doubts about the case. The investigation re-examined evidence and interviewed witnesses. While it concluded that there wasn't enough evidence to support theories of criminal conduct, it did acknowledge that there were factual discrepancies and unanswered questions in the case. Ultimately, the 1982 investigation maintained the original finding of probable suicide. However, it failed to silence all doubts about the circumstances of Monroe's death. For many, the idea that such a vibrant and successful woman could have taken her own life is difficult to accept. For others, it's impossible to fathom. More than 60 years after her death, Marilyn Monroe remains a cultural icon. Her tragic and mysterious end has become an integral part of her legend, inspiring countless books, documentaries, and works of fiction. The ongoing fascination with Monroe's death not only speaks of her popularity as a social icon and movie star, but also reflects our morbid fascination with conspiracy theories and unsolved mysteries, especially those involving famous figures. The death of Marilyn Monroe has officially been filed as a suicide by law enforcement, but questions and theories surrounding her passing grow larger and louder with each passing year. All we know for certain is that on August 4th, 1962, the world lost a talented actress and a complex individual who had overcome a difficult childhood to become one of the most famous women in the world. Monroe's struggle with mental health issues and substance abuse was well documented, adding a layer of tragedy to her untimely death. Whether Monroe's death was suicide, an accidental overdose, or something more sinister, the loss of such a bright star at such a young age will always be a tragedy. We'll probably never know what exactly happened that night back in 1962, 
but the mystery Marilyn has left behind has ensured she will never be forgotten. I'll never forget those dark days in Gévaudan. It was the summer of 1764 when the whispers started. Tales of a monstrous beast stalking our countryside. At first I didn't believe it. Wolves were common enough, but this… this was something different. I remember the day when Marie Jean Valet came running into the village pale as death. She spoke of a creature as big as a donkey with a terrible jaw and ears that stood straight up. If not for her bulls, she said, she'd have been torn to pieces. We comforted her, but secretly, we were terrified. Weeks later, young Jean Bollet wasn't so lucky. When we found her body, God forgive me, I, I've never seen anything so horrific. That's when the fear truly set in. No one felt safe anymore, especially the women and children. We men organized hunting parties determined to end this nightmare. I joined every hunt, my musket at the ready, searching the forests and fields. But the beast was always one step ahead, leaving only bloodshed in its wake. Even when the king's own hunters came and killed a massive wolf, we dared to hope it was over. But the attacks resumed, worse than before. The beast no longer feared our cattle, nothing seemed to stop it. For three long years we lived in terror. Every rustle in the bushes, every shadow at dusk could be the monster. I, I lost count of the number of funerals. The grieving families, the children, too scared to sleep. When Jean Chastel finally killed the beast in 1767, we rejoiced. But doubts lingered. Was it truly just a wolf? A, a werewolf? Some unnatural hybrid? To this day, I I'm not sure what stalked our lands, but I will never forget the fear that gripped us all during those terrible years of the Beast of Gevudan. Long ago, in different parts of Europe, two strange and frightening events took place. These stories, filled with mystery and fear, have puzzled people for hundreds of years. These unusual creatures terrorized small towns and sparked wild theories about their true nature. Our first story takes us back to 1685 in a place called Ansbach, which is now part of Germany. Back then it was part of the Holy Roman Empire. The people of Ansbach were living in fear because a wolf had started attacking farm animals and even children. But this wasn't just any ordinary wolf. Many people believed it was something much more sinister. The townspeople had an idea about who this wolf really was. They thought it might be their former leader, called the Burgomaster, named Michael Leicht. Leicht had recently died, but he wasn't a very nice person when he was alive. He had been mean to the people of Ansbach for many years. Some people said they saw Leicht at his own funeral. Others claimed to have seen a wolf wearing a white sheet like a ghost near Leicht's old house. These strange sightings made people think that maybe Leicht's spirit had turned into a wolf after he died. The townspeople decided they needed to catch this wolf. They dug a big hole in the ground, covered it with branches and straw, and put a rooster inside as bait. The plan worked, the wolf fell into the trap and the hunters quickly killed it. What happened next was very unusual. The hunters took the dead wolf and paraded it through the streets of Ansbach. They wanted everyone to see that the dangerous animal was gone. But they didn't stop there. They cut off the wolf's fur and put a mask on its face that looked like Michael liked. They even dressed it up in a wig and a coat to make it look more like the former burgomaster. Then in a very strange move, they hung the wolf's body from a tall frame called a gibbet. It stayed there for everyone to see for several days. People even wrote poems about the wolf, calling it evil and saying it got what it deserved. 
I, Wolf, was a grim beast and devourer of many children, which I far preferred to fat sheep and steers. A rooster killed me, a well was my death. I now hang from the gallows for the ridicule of all people. As a spirit and a wolf I bothered men. How appropriate now that people say, Ah, you damned spirit who entered the wolf. You now swing from the gallows disguised as a man. This is your fair compensation, the gift you have earned. This you deserve, a gibbet is your grave. Take this reward because you have devoured the sons of men. Like a fierce and ferocious beast, a real child eater. This might seem like a weird thing to do, but for the people of Ansbach, it had a special meaning. They believed that by dressing up the wolf like a person, they were showing that they knew the truth, that it wasn't just a wolf, but their old leader in disguise. It was also a way for them to finally stand up to the mean burgomaster, even though he was already dead. After a few days, they took the wolf down and put its body in a museum. People could go and see it for many years after that. Now let's jump forward in time about 80 years and move to a different country, France, in a region called Gévaudan. Another scary creature was causing trouble. This story began in the 1760s and lasted for three whole years. The Beast of Gévaudan, as it came to be known, was attacking people in the countryside. It mostly went after women and children who were alone in the forests or fields. The attacks were very violent and many people died. People who saw the beast and lived to tell about it said it was huge, as big as a donkey. They described it as having a long jaw, pointy ears that stood up, and a furry tail. Some thought it might be a wolf or a hyena, but others believed it was something supernatural, like a werewolf. The first attack happened in the summer of 1764. A young woman named Marie Jean Vallée was charged at by the beast, but the bulls she was looking after protected her. A few weeks later, the beast killed its first victim, a 14-year-old girl named Jean Boulet. As more and more attacks happened, people became very scared. The local leaders decided they needed to do something. They organized big hunting parties to try and find and kill the beast. Thousands of men joined these hunts. The attacks were so bad that even the King of France, Louis XV, heard about them. He sent professional wolf hunters to help. These hunters killed some wolves, including a very big one that some people thought might be the beast. They sent its stuffed body to the king, thinking they had solved the problem. But the attacks started again after a short break. This time, the beast seemed to act differently. Before, it had been afraid of cattle, but now it wasn't. The attack went on for another year and a half, with many more people killed. Finally, in June 1767, a local hunter named Jean Chastel killed another large wolf. When they cut open its stomach, they found parts of a person inside. After this, the attacks stopped for good. Even though the attacks ended, people still weren't sure what the Beast of Gévaudan really was. Some thought it might have been more than one animal. Others wondered if it was a mix between a wolf and a large dog. There were even strange ideas that it might have been a lion or a hyena, even though these animals didn't live in France. Both of these stories, The Wolf of Ansbach and The Beast of Gévaudan, have puzzled people for hundreds of years. They show us how scared people were of wild animals in the past, especially wolves. But they also tell us something about how people's imaginations can run wild when they're afraid. In Ansbach, the idea of a werewolf or a person turning into an animal after death was something many people believed in back then. The Beast of Gévaudan story is interesting because it lasted so long and affected so many people. It's hard for us to imagine now, but back then, living in the countryside could be very dangerous. Wild animals were a real threat, and when something unusual happened, it could cause widespread panic. These stories have become famous over time. They've been written about in books, shown in movies, and talked about by historians. People still argue about what really happened in both cases. Were these just regular wolves that seemed scarier because people were afraid? Were they some other kind of animal that people didn't recognize? Or was there something more mysterious, possibly paranormal, going on? 
In Ansbach, the townspeople used the wolf to represent their anger at their former leader. In Gevudan, the whole country came together to try and solve the mystery of the beast. Today we know a lot more about wolves and other wild animals. We understand that they usually avoid humans and only attack when they feel threatened or are very hungry. But then, those are normal wolves. Who knows how to predict the actions and motives of a werewolf? Coming up, the Hellfire Club, a secret society from the 1700s provided a space for high-standing individuals to indulge in intellectual pursuits and social activities without judgment, but it also became infamous for its rumored hedonistic behaviors and dark rituals, though its true purpose and activities remain shrouded in mystery even today, making the rumors about it all the more tantalizing. But first, in 2003, Christine Paolila shocked her Texas community by going from a bullied high school student to a convicted killer. It's a tragic story of friendship, love, drugs, violence, and murder. That story is up next. So far on my low-carb journey, I've lost over 50 pounds. Everybody's different, but it appears slashing the number of carbs I consume has had the biggest impact for me. And discovering Built Bars has made the journey a lot easier by replacing my high-carb, high-sugar desserts with something that still tastes like a candy bar, but only has 150 calories, is low-carb, and is packed with protein. If I'm craving a late-night snack, instead of heading to the fridge or pantry for something I know isn't good for me, I just grab a Built Bar. I've used Built Bars as breakfast on a fairly regular basis, which not only keeps me from the unhealthy fast food, but means I also don't waste money on those fast food places either. If low-carb is your life, try Built Bars. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Built. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness, all one word, and get 10% off your entire purchase. WeirdDarkness.com slash built, promo code WeirdDarkness. In a shocking case that rocked a Texas community, Christine Paolila went from being a bullied high school student to a convicted murderer. This story shows how friendship, drugs, and violence can lead to terrible consequences. Christine Paolila had a tough start in life. When she was only two years old, her father died in a construction accident. Soon after, her grandparents passed away too. Christine's mother struggled with drug addiction, so at age seven, Christine went to live with her other grandparents. Things got even harder for Christine when she was diagnosed with alopecia in kindergarten. This is a medical condition that makes people lose their hair. Christine lost all her hair, eyebrows and eyelashes. She had to wear wigs to look normal, but other kids still made fun of her. Throughout school, Christine was bullied because of how she looked. Kids would pull off her wig and tease her. Her mother said this bullying was devastating for Christine. In high school, things started to look up for Christine. She made two close friends, Tiffany Roll and Rachel Coloradus. These girls were a year older than Christine and very popular. They decided to help Christine fit in better. Tiffany and Rachel gave Christine a complete makeover. They helped her get a new wig, taught her how to do her makeup, and picked out new clothes for her. Christine became so well-liked that in her senior year, her classmates voted her Miss Irresistible. As Christine became more popular, she started using drugs. In 2003, she began dating a 21-year-old man named Chris Snyder. Christine's parents didn't like Snyder because he'd been in trouble with the law before. Christine and Snyder's relationship was very unhealthy. They would fight in public, and both were reportedly violent towards each other. Christine's family and friends, including Tiffany and Rachel, told her to break up with Snyder. This made Snyder angry, and he tried to keep Christine away from her family and friends. On July 18, 2003, something terrible happened. Christine and Snyder went to Tiffany Rubble's house. 
There, they shot and killed four people – Tiffany Roll, Rachel Coloradus, Marcus Ray Priscilla, Tiffany's boyfriend, and Adelbert Nicholas Sanchez, Marcus's cousin. Christine later said they went to the house to steal drugs and money. She claimed Snyder started shooting unexpectedly and forced her to shoot too. However, evidence showed that two guns were used at the same time, contradicting Christine's story. The scene was very violent. Rachel Coloradus was hurt the worst, with investigators saying there was an overkill in her death. This made some people think the attack might have been personal. After killing their victims, Christine and Snyder left the scene. Surprisingly, Christine went to work at Walgreens less than an hour later, acting as if nothing had happened. When the murders were announced, Christine pretended to be upset. She didn't go to her friend's funerals, saying she was too depressed. In 2004, she went to therapy for drug addiction. Around this time, Snyder went to jail for something unrelated, and their relationship ended. For years, the police couldn't figure out who committed the murders. They had very little evidence and no clear motive. A neighbor saw two people leaving the house but couldn't identify them clearly. In July 2006, the police finally got a break. Someone called in an anonymous tip, saying Christine had confessed to the murders while in therapy. The police tracked Christine down to a hotel room in San Antonio and arrested her. While in drug treatment in 2004, Christine met and fell in love with Stanley Justin Rott. They got married and tried to start a new life without drugs. Christine had inherited $360,000 from her father, which they used to buy a condo. However, their new life didn't last long. When Christine saw sketches of the murder suspects on TV, she panicked and confessed to Rott. They fled to a small hotel room in San Antonio, where they lived for seven months, using drugs and eating junk food. Finally, Rott called the police and turned Christine in. She was arrested on July 19, 2006, almost exactly three years after the murders. After Christine was arrested, the police went looking for Chris Snyder, but when they searched his home, they found he had disappeared. Later, they discovered his body in nearby woods. He had taken his own life with pills after hearing the police were coming for him. In 2008, Christine was put on trial. She was found guilty of four counts of murder. Because she was only 17 when the crimes happened, she couldn't be given the death penalty. Instead, she was sentenced to life in prison. Today, Christine Paolila is in Mountain View Unit Prison in Gatesville, Texas. She won't be able to ask for parole until 2046, after serving 35 years in prison. This case left many people with questions. Why did Christine turn on her friends who had helped her? Was it really about stealing drugs and money, or was there more to it? Some people think jealousy might have played a part, but we may never know the full truth. The Hellfire Club has a history that dates back to the 1700s. It was a secret society in Britain made up of high-standing individuals who wanted a place where they could have fun and be themselves without being judged. While the club discouraged and punished vile acts at meetings, many believed they encouraged behaviors that were considered hedonistic at that time. Ironically, the club and its founders, such as Sir Francis Dashwood, were involved with the church, prayer sessions, and abbeys. Sir Francis Dashwood is often credited with starting the first Hellfire Club, although there were other similar clubs before it. Born into greatness, he was the only son of his namesake father, the first baronet, and inherited the title of 11th Baron Le Dispenser at Eton. He befriended William Pitt the Elder. When Dashwood was just 15, his father passed away, leaving him all the family estates and the title Baronetcy of Dashwood of Wickham. In the years that followed, Dashwood traveled throughout Europe, earning a reputation among the social elite and creating social clubs as a form of entertainment. The most well-known and controversial of these was the Hellfire Club. Dashwood had a wild streak. Some historians say he impersonated monarchs like Charles XII and tried to seduce Serena Anne in Russia. He was allegedly expelled from the Papal States, but his travels also had a serious side. 
He absorbed the culture and sights of France, Germany, Italy, and Denmark. In 1733, he created the Society of Dilettanti, a club to encourage interest in classical art and fine dining. This club exists still today. Encouraged by this success, Dashwood founded another club in 1744 dedicated to those with an interest in the Ottoman Empire. Named the Divan Club, it disbanded after only two years, but Dashwood had a vision for yet another club that made him famous – the Hellfire Club. Inspired by the Duke of Wharton's club in 1719, Dashwood collaborated with the Earl of Sandwich. Throughout the 1730s they met in the Georgian Vulture Inn under the name Brotherhood of St. Francis of Wickham. Eventually, the founders changed the name to the Order of the Knights of St. Francis. Dashwood wanted to replicate the luxury and exclusivity of the Duke of Wharton's club, but with a longer lifespan. As the club's membership grew, Dashwood realized they needed a bigger venue. He found the ruins of a Cistercian Abbey in West Wickham, six miles from his home. The location was remote enough to avoid eavesdroppers, but was in disrepair, with only a few columns and walls remaining. Dashwood enlisted architect Nicholas Rivette to renovate the structure, adding a cloister of half a dozen arches and a new tower. Giuseppe Borgnes decorated the ceilings with fresco paintings. The club held meetings twice a year, with members required to wear costumes. The exact dates of the meetings vary, but were likely in March, June, August, or early October. Members enjoyed good food and the company of cheerful ladies of lively dispositions. Each member could bring a guest, provided they were of a particular standing. The greatest recommendation was wit and humor. Drinks flowed freely, and women entertained members, guests, or themselves at any time. However, nothing indecent was allowed, and those caught engaging in such acts were dealt with severely. Toasts and ribald singing were common. The story goes that before one gathering, a live baboon was placed in Lord Sandwich's room. Far from being shocked, Sandwich dressed the baboon in his ceremonial costume and locked it in a chest. When the trunk was opened in front of the members, the baboon leaped out, landing on Sandwich's shoulders. Sandwich reportedly pleaded, "'Spare me, gracious devil! Spare a wretch who never was sincerely your servant! I sinned only from the vanity of being in the fashion! Thou knowest I never have been half so wicked as I pretended, never have been able to commit the thousandth part of the vices which I have boasted of! Leave me, therefore, and go to those who are more truly devoted to your service. I am but half a sinner." By the mid-1760s, the club was waning. The Abbey was no longer viable as a venue, and in March 1766, the chapter room was stripped of its adornments. Dashwood decided to remove all traces of the club from the Abbey. However, he did not abandon the Hellfire Club. He moved the meetings to nearby caves he had excavated years earlier. These became the new Hellfire Caves. The switch to the caves suggested to outsiders that the club had something to hide. Images of men sitting in dark caves wearing hooded costumes hinted at satanic worship or black masses. Rumors of ritualistic sacrifices of babies at makeshift altars spread, although there was little evidence of such activities. More likely, some religious ceremonies took place regularly. The Hellfire Club's modern-day image is one of wickedness. However, contemporary reports suggest the club aimed to enliven dull Sunday traditions and educate members in new knowledge or abilities. Gossip mongers claimed the club scorned religion, engaged in foul vices, and derided the clergy. They believed religious parodies occurred at the club. Some concluded that Dashwood and his members were Satanists. However, in 1751, Dashwood fully restored St. Lawrence Church. This act convinced many skeptics that he was not a Satanist, as it seemed unlikely for one to spend so much money on a church. Still, some found the church's design too heathen for their tastes. The true activities of the Hellfire Club remain a mystery. Non-members' imaginations likely fueled the club's dark reputation. Any member who spoke about the club might be accused of lying. The Hellfire Club and its members could never win against public perception. When Weird Darkness Returns – Oakville, Washington, a small town with fewer than a thousand residents. They experienced an unusual event in the summer of 1994. On August 7th, 
clear, gelatinous blobs fell from the sky, soon followed by a mysterious illness affecting the townspeople. Despite various theories, from jellyfish particles to star jelly, the true nature of the Oakville blobs remains a mystery, leaving the town and the rest of the world without clear answers. About a year ago, I began getting tons of notifications about how somebody was trying to log into my social media. I was getting email phishing scams on a daily basis. I was being inundated with email sales pitches from companies I'd never even heard of. I was getting calls and texts from those same companies. I was listening to a podcast that talked about Incogni, short for incognito, and I thought I'd give it a try. For the past year, Incogni has reduced the number of email and spam calls and texts that I receive, it's helped to protect my identity from hackers, and helps keep my data safe. Over the past year, Incogni has successfully removed my personal information from over 200 different data brokerage sites, and I get regular updates on how many are still in progress, how many have been successfully completed, and how many requests were sent out to remove my personal information. It would have taken me over 160 hours to do all of this, and nobody has time or patience for that. Fortunately, it's all taken care of by Incogni. I live online, personally and professionally, and I trust Incogni to help me live with a lot less worry. You can give Incogni a try right now by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. That's short for incognito. I-N-C-O-G-N-I. WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. Oakville, Washington. It's a small town boasting a population of less than a thousand people. If you're from a small town yourself, you know not much happens in these places. But in the summer of 1994, something did. Like any town in Washington, Oakville was used to its share of rain. But the rain that fell on that day, August 7th, was no ordinary rain. A strange phenomenon occurred when blobs of clear, gelatinous goo fell from the sky. Soon after, the town was covered in this thick substance, and people began getting sick. Reports of the strange substance described the drops as no larger than a grain of rice. While the globs were translucent, they were so thick that they made visibility through windshields almost impossible. And perhaps weirder than one inexplicable torrential downpour of goo is the fact that in the three weeks following the August 7th incident, there were five more reports of raining blobs, all within 20 square miles. The sickness struck the people of Oakville the first day it rained the blobs. After making contact with the blobs or being in close proximity, individuals developed flu-like symptoms, including fatigue and nausea. As people became violently ill, some had trouble breathing. One woman, Dottie Hearn, collapsed from her symptoms, only to be hospitalized for three days with an ear infection. There were even reports of animals dying. But what was this strange goop? And was it truly connected to the sickness wreaking havoc across Oakville? The local hospital tested the substance and found that it contained human white blood cells. Meanwhile, Dottie Hearn's daughter, Sonny Barcliff, sent a sample of one of the blobs to Washington State's Hazardous Material Unit at the Department of Ecology. Scientist Mike Osweiler declared their investigation found two types of bacteria within these blobs, yet they could not identify which kinds. However, argued that the blobs could not contain human white blood cells, as the cells in the blobs did not have nuclei. When the Oakville blobs were featured on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries, microbiologist Mike McDowell was able to identify one of the strains of bacteria as one that was known to have an adverse effect on the human digestive system. Any further testing was derailed when the samples disappeared from McDowell's lab. As for what exactly these jello-like globs were, there is no accepted answer, but of course there are plenty of theories. One small but passionate group believes the Oakville blobs to be jellyfish, or parts of them at least. The theory behind this is that bombing runs performed by the Air Force caused jellyfish particles to be dispersed into rain clouds. 
Although it was confirmed that these tests were done in the Pacific Ocean about 50 miles away from Oakville, the rest of the claim remains unsubstantiated. Another theory points to these blobs being made up of star jelly. Reports of star jelly, also known as astral jelly or astromixin, go back as far as the 14th century. Described in much the same way as the Oakville blobs, this substance is named after the legend that claims the goo hails from the sky during meteor showers. Legend aside, no one can actually agree on the origin of star jelly. Research has found reports of star jelly to be frog spawn, sodium polyacrylate crystals, algae, and beyond. Other appearances of this jelly, as in Somerset's Ham Wall Nature Reserve in 2013, remain unidentified. A third theory about the blobs asserted that they were fluid waste from an airplane toilet. It would explain why white blood cells might have been present and why airplane lavatory systems implement antifreeze, which would cause the symptoms to spread across town. The U.S. Federal Aviation Administration jumped into the conversation to refute this claim, citing the fact that airplane waste would have a blue coloring rather than translucence. The fact that it's nearly impossible to verify the most sensational of the reports makes it all the more difficult to say what the Oakville blobs actually were. Not only can it not be verified that any samples of the goo mysteriously vanished, but oddly enough there's no record of the Washington Department of Health even receiving a sample to begin with. As for the rain, it supposedly came in the middle of the night and cannot be factually corroborated. Some believe the blobs didn't fall from the sky at all, but came from a more earthbound source. It's not impossible to believe the mystery substance came from the sky, however, as stranger occurrences such as meat falling from the sky and frogs raining with a storm have been documented. Still, as there are no remaining samples, the investigation into this bizarre phenomenon has officially hit a dead end. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description, as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Psalm 34 verse 10 the lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. And a final thought. A fault once denied is twice committed. Thomas Fuller I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. But now, more independent evidence has surfaced. But now, more independent evidence. More independent evidence. More independent evidence. But now, more independent evidence. Ev <laughs> evidence. More independent evidence. Or that tomb robbers had messed with the bodies to make them look alien. Rut re Rut recent? Rut row. Rut row. I have a. I have an extra word there. Rut row.